material for the brain. Conversations for thinking bodies. Hello, Deborah. Uh, welcome to my podcast. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Hello, Matan. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. it's a big pleasure to have you here. And I'm very excited to, to have a, a conversation with you. Uh, but before we, we start, I thought just to introduce you. And of course, you're welcome to add things or uh, whatever mm. you want. So uh, uh, Deborah was uh, born in the UK and she studied in the Royal Ballet School in London, where she graduated, where she, where she graduated. Uh, in which year did you graduate? 90, 1990. Yeah. And, and afterwards, she, she moved to, to Germany and she's been working for 14 years in opera houses and state theaters. And in 2007, she founded a Soz of Vision in Motion Dance Academy in Kassel. And three years after, uh, it's uh, own uh, dance theater company. And where she's currently the artistic director, and she's also an entrepreneur, a choreographer, a performer, a teacher, and she also holds a black belt in Kung Fu, <laughs> and she's also a mother. And did I forget anything? <laughs> um, no, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of things that uh, mm. she can juggle, and that's already quite impressive. And yeah, the first thing I wanted to ask is just to... To ask you how are you and what are you doing now at the moment uh, mm -hmm. where, where life takes you I'm, I'm, last time we've met was quite some time ago and, and i'm very curious just to hear what is going on with you with the school hmm. the castle. yeah well we're all healthy i mean we're very feeling very lucky at the moment that we can go to the studio still every day um, we are considered a school like everywhere else um, is still allowed to go to school so we're meeting in the studio every day and we're moving a lot. Um, I think um, for me, it's a little bit like uh, this, this uh, pandemic thing is going on and I go inside so, so, and then I forget it the whole day. And then I don't remember it again until I go shopping and have to put my mask on or something. It's a bit like that at the moment. I, it's, it's carrying me through this time very well. Um, I'm healthy and fit. The students are also healthy and fit. And um, I think it's really been important through this time to, to try to f keep some flow going. Really, I've been fighting for flow. I've been fighting for consistency for the students, for their mental health. Um, um, yeah, I mean, not at the expense of risking their health, of course, in, in, the, in the pandemic situation, but um, to, uh, we we call it in German der Blick auf das Ganze, also keeping your eyes on the whole picture, which is for me really important in 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 as a school director anyway. Um, yes, there are many things that come up politically, socially that can become very big and important, but it's still just part of a whole picture. And so I'm always trying to um, put my eyes on the whole picture and to think of what is still important. The mental health of my students is still important. And um, yeah, so yeah, the lockdown was strange this year. And even to experience people having, you know, even starting to experience panic attacks after having six weeks at home, you know, they don't share a flat with anyone, they're alone and they can't go back to their families. And uh, this, this really, this is what really helped me to think, okay, keep your eyes on the big picture, keep your eyes on the big picture. It is possible to have some kind of continuity. Um, yeah. So it's good, it's good. We're thankful, we're just thankful, really. This is a, a great attitude. Yeah, because you can really get caught up with like the, you know, like the little personal miseries. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I can share this feeling with you that although there is a lot of challenges altogether, I'm trying to, to remind myself to practice gratitude. And, mm. You know, actually, I was thinking um, a few days ago before when I was already a bit planning or, or like questioning how, how it's going to go this conversation. I, I, I was thinking that it's pretty an interesting situation to be to be a director of a school and especially a dance school because I, when I when I think about my old, my own dance studies, there is exactly the, the the theme of continuity of and this kind of 
every day in the studio and meeting the same people and this kind of safe bubble that you are going through in, in and especially, I mean, many, many I mean, how I see Sozo is a very warm community. So how, how was it actually for the people to suddenly be disconnected from each other and, mm. and for you not to see them every day? And, and how, how did it affect you personally? Yeah. Um, it came in the middle of March, right? The first one. And we had to close from one day to the next. Um, I did rig up overnight everything on Zoom. Um, fortunately, I had been working with Zoom and some online platforms um, for a few years. Now, so it wasn't something that was totally shocking me. And I had an assistant to help me. Um, the students were great. They decided they all cleared a two by two meter space in their in their bedrooms or somewhere in their flat, even hanging on to the bathroom sink or something like that. But um, we made a, a plan. So they were always moving in the mornings and in the afternoons they had something like learning to make a website or their dance history lectures or um, something like some discussing some composition tools and then making some exercises. The weather was amazing in March and April in Germany. So I was encouraging them to also go outside uh, every day. Um, but it was the first week they loved it. Like we had a Zoom meeting every week at the end of the week and you have to realize Sozo is small. We are 25 students in a thousand square meters plus the few teachers that are always there that ch changes a bit from week to week or every two or three weeks. And um, so, yeah, we're like a family in that sense, um, depending on how much you want to really be intensively involved in this family or, um, I mean, I respect always the, the privacy of the students. Um, the first week they loved it because it was something new and they were like, wow, we're really rocking this. We are keeping going. And we, they were really on their mats at 8.30 in the morning for Pilates. <laughs> really and you had this screen of I mean everything was new for them and they were super excited very positive um yeah we had some funny moments these funny recorded moments of uh, how people were uh, activating with the with the tools the zoom tools and um the digital way of life kind of thing the second week I started noticing that some people were not logging in and so it was just like this case of writing some kind emails, you know, um, how are you doing and um, or writing generally every couple of days, you know, how is it, how are you all doing? Um, if you have any questions, if you need something, if you need a, you know, a laptop because you don't have good internet or whatever, just tell me, we'll try to fix something. Um, and then in the third week, uh, which was the week before the Easter holiday. So we really just had this three week block to do. Um, we had the Zoom meeting and it was very clear. Everybody was saying, hmm, if the lockdown goes on after the Easter holidays, we would prefer to have a longer Easter holiday. And as soon as we can open again, we will dance into the summer holidays <laughs> or move into the summer holidays. So that's actually what we did. We took, uh, we, we were then actually only closed for one week longer than the, the Easter holidays. And since the 27th of April, Sozo has been going. We haven't had to close again since. Um, so we literally had those three weeks online, which was probably a very good learning experience for some of the students just to, um, to yeah, it's a, it's, everything is a life learning experience to see how do I deal with those kind of situations and then to reflect on it afterwards. Um, and then of course the thankfulness to come back into the studio was amazing. Um, I, I, I let them come back gradually. So first, just the third years because they had exams. Um, and then the second and, and first years came back the week after. So we just got used to, you know, how do people feel about being together in this room again? And um, yeah, I mean, it, it was, was quite amazing. Yeah, but they, they got all their exams done. They um, finished their modules. Um, uh, the, the amount of communication that was needed to be done was much, much more. Uh, it just makes me realize how important communication is and to try to keep up the personal communication. You, you mentioned before, like, uh, yeah, a bit, the, um, the, the community aspect, and you, you even said that Sozo is a little bit like a family. And, and yeah, and, and, and there, this is a theme that I've been interested in for several years um, and I had you know I, I, I had my 
I've been changing my mind several times about if, if the dance scene is a dance scene or a dance community and what are the differences and mm. what, 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 makes, what makes a place a community? Is it, is it mm. the fact that we share a certain passion? Is it, is it because we care of each other? Or like, what are the parameters? And, 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 mm. and there was several years that I was really feeling part of a community and there's, and, and in, in the last few years, I think I've, I've started to distance myself more and, and kind of fall back into my own family mm. for, for when I need this kind of support. And, and I'm curious to ask you, like, maybe you can share a little bit like what, what does it feel for you to be, to, to be the, to have, to have created this community or, and, and what kind of role it plays in your own life to, because mm. I know, it, I mean, also just for the viewers, uh, Sozo is a is a three year academy and and the, the people keep keep on changing so so it's also there is also a certain aspect of uh, yeah of of um, a, a constant change there so mm. yeah so so what what are your thoughts on that Yeah, you're absolutely right there actually because I'm the one that was always there and I'm the one that will stay there. <laughs> I hold the space. So being a space holder is um it's a privilege one it's a it's a total privilege to hold a space for people to pass through and i think um for each of the i mean if you think since 2007 i have just had the 54th graduate and i know all their names <laughs> and can still know kind of like what they're doing and what they are so like number 50 was just graduating this year the 50th person plus four more as i it was always just in alphabetical order so um, yeah, this passing through, I think we've developed over the years, some, some ways of being together, of learning together and this passing on so that when, when, before you even leave, you've already passed on to the new first years. If you're a third year, some, and this is like almost not explainable. It's not like I can put my finger on certain things. It just happens. I think it's, a. um, uh, I find that by the stu time the students get to the third year that they really, that they're still willing to invest in Sozo, which is for me, um, amazing. I mean, I, I, I know that normally in life, especially young people, when they, when they're getting to a certain point in their career of, or, or just on the verge of going into something after their education, that actually you're leaving something behind and you're already looking forward. And I remember in my education, um, actually, even though I enjoyed every moment of it, um, in the third year was already looking, I mean, that whole third year was spent thinking about and what comes next. Next year, I don't have a studio. Next year, I don't have training. Next year, I have to get a job. Ne and it's like very looking forwards. And yet, somehow, um, they're, they're, I, I see so much willingness, even though they're in the third year to invest, they come to meetings, they, they still initiate things, they pass on. Um, so all this gets passed on, it gets like passed down to the new class and they get excited about things and then they grow with those things. Um, it can even be something small like our vision day that every year we do a vision day, so we have a supervision, somebody external that I invite to work with us teachers and students on, on one level about something, some area of the school. Last year, we worked on our internal communication. Um, the year before, we worked on some parts of the um, curriculum. Um, we've also, yeah, worked on many things like how can we be more visible? Um, like what's our profile to the outside world? Mm. Um, yeah, and uh, I mean, for sure, I think coming up this as the, in, the, in the spring of, 21 we will probably work on something to do with now I mean it's always to do with what what is our situation now and um, how what is our future um, so thinking forwards feeding forwards I think um, and, and maybe maybe I, I can ask you something a little bit more personal but you, you also have a family you're also a mother you have a daughter yeah, and a yeah. partner and and, and so, so what what is the relation between those two? Like, because mm. because if if you if you if you if you say Sozo is like a family, so where, where, how do you how the how the two families meet? Or mm. and and I'm and I'm very curious to ask 
ask it because I feel that I, I, I'm only after uh, eight years working since I've graduated. I'm starting to learn how to negotiate the tension between, you know, family, work, but I don't have anything that I would call it a family. So I'm mm. very curious. To Absolutely. You're that. right. That is, a, that, is a, that is something that also takes time. And I think um, to, um, I mean, my husband and I, we met in the opera house, but he is not in the artistic field necessarily. I would say he's actually quite artistic, very creative, very practically creative. Um, and so in many ways we can work very well together where we're working on the project like of building out the studios. I mean, he did all the, the, the floors and, and, and creating this, the space so that it can be flexible and um, uh, coming up with solutions for difficult situations in the building. Um, and we also share um, a love for the nature and um, we're, we're both not materialistic at all. So we're more interested in our health and, um, um, functionality of things and practicality of things. Uh, we don't collect loads of stuff and we're not interested in having the new, we don't have a car. Um, we go everywhere with a bike. Um, there's lots of things that connect us already that make the time at home um, very pleasurable, but it doesn't mean that I mean, my, that the hours that I had to put in um, building up sometimes or, or in certain phases of Sozo or also still being an artist myself, it will al it always causes tension, like uh, the, the amount of time I am actually here home. Um, but actually, I realized in the last years that I, I, I also, I mean, like, we're married 15 years, um, Zoe is 14. So um, it's, I think it's a long, a long journey, but I'm happy to be in this journey. And it's, um, I don't think I could do it. I, I mean, I couldn't have the Sozo family without this family. It's, uh, it has priority, of course. Yeah. Um, and as long as it has the priority, I realize I can, I can give a lot in Sozo when I have this tank um, here at home. And they are for me like a love tank in that sense hmm. um, that keeps uh, me filled up. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, of course, it's, uh, it's always doing this. It's like doing the splits now, keeping our <laughs> jugg jugg juggling balls. Um, and I think actually they, each person in the family is, is, has their own role in getting used to this situation or getting to know each other. I mean, I always, I always um, felt that as an artist, as a dance artist, that my children, my, we, we have one child, but um, that my child would, it would not be that I would have to give it up for, for him or her. And um, I think we don't have children to give up our own lives. We have children so that they walk alongside us. So like we walk together actually. And I'm sure that, um, that uh, my daughter learned a lot from even laying in studios on a blanket while I was still doing the rehearsal or, she, she became very creative. She could pack a rucksack um, to go anywhere from the age of three, yeah? With pencils, paper, scissors, um, a play camera, whatever was in there. And she would just occupy herself. And it was never like, mommy, I'm bored. Or I just knew she would be into something and I could just concentrate on my rehearsal or my training or, uh, but she would be with me. She would we'd pack everything on the bike. She'd sit in the seat behind. And um, so for years, I, I mean, I, I actually cried the day, the last time she rode on my bike with me, she was too heavy <laughs> to sit in the chair. That was for me really sad. The last time going up this hill with my thighs nearly bursting. Um, I remember this and I remember her singing songs behind me. I mean, this is the thing that I, that could make me cry actually. I mean, they're the things that fill me every day. You know, actually I, I, I must say that to, to juggle these, two words, I find it extremely challenging because uh, I remember when my first daughter, I have two kids, and when my first daughter was born, somebody gave us this book, The Continuum Principle, and, and basically the book is a, is a woman describing the experiences of living next to the in indigenous tribes and how they grow mm. their kids differently than to, and the book was written in the 70s, so to the, to the parenting culture that was um, present in the USA 
And, and basically what the book is kind of suggesting is exactly what you said, like uh, the, the, your kids should just be part of your life. And that, there, and that there is, you don't need to stop your life in order to grow kids. And also that kids are, are not a disturbance for life. That they're, no. they're just part of life. Mm. But there is also something a bit, con- a bit that contradicts it in the world of dance. This kind of the, the show must go on, you know, the premiere, <laughs> the, the tension, the, the importance. And also the, you know, the world of art is, is full of big egos and people that really mm. prioritize art above all. And, and how did you manage to, you know, to, especially um, if, if, I don't know if, when, when, so I guess if I'm calculating correct, so when Zoe was born, you were still working as a dancer, no? Um, yes and no. Yes, yes. It was the, it was the, the year where I was, um, actually I was dancing in the documenter, the year when she turned one. I stayed home for one year um, and I just went, kept my training up. And, um, and then I got a job in a, um, it was a temporary, uh, Trisha Brown company for the, uh, documenter here in Castle. And, um, that's actually the first time we would, we would start giving her up just for my rehearsals to a, a, a day mother who had three other ch- children. So it was, it was just this, um, this, these few hours every morning. And we thought actually she's, she's an, she's an only child and why not? Uh, to that she learns already that there are other children around she doesn't um get selfish or um jealous um yeah and this lady was just living across the street everything super practical um but actually um because my husband works also in the opera house and has um these kind of shift hours also working in the evenings with the performances as a technician um we had zoe was very lucky she had some mornings with mummy some mornings with daddy uh some when we were both home um but it was often that my husband and I would give the door like he would come in I would go out and then or he would come in and I would go out and she had one or the other of us but I mean for her I guess I guess great yeah um and I I think actually that my husband and I had very different ways of spending our time with her so she got like we didn't have any rules or um uh my my husband was um yeah i think maybe based on 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 his on his um past um more um more nervous or caring or and i grew up in england where we went to school with bare legs and knee socks and um no scarf around our necks and i think oh god in germany they pack their children up so um so well all the time always you have to have a hat on and a scarf and and i was like I don't know this. <laughs> I still go out in my bare feet, you know, in, in, in November and December. Um, yeah. So it was like, there's sometimes like for me, I just used to leave her like, uh, you know, and my husband more. Um, but I think uh, it's uh, good to have this uh, diversity and to just let the other partner be a little bit. Um, that's also a learning experience, a learning phase, I think too. I think I'm waving from your question, actually. So it was about. Um, you know what I was what, what I was curious is just how did you manage to, you know, to 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 handle this specific tension that come from the performance. Ah, uh, the artist, world, yes. Well, yeah. well, parenting. I mean, at least yeah. this is my experience of parenting yeah. that yeah. there is something very immediate about it. You know, like yes. there are needs; they need to be taken yes. care. Of. You cannot kind of, especially when when you're talking about young uh, children. And, and, and in, the, in the dance world, there is this necessity as well. Like it, mm. it has to happen now. We have a deadline. Mm. And, and, and mm. how did you manage it more, more internally yeah. to handle yeah. with those, those tensions? Well, I think um, one is that I've managed to go in phases so that there's been years where I didn't perform so much, but I was really concentrating on the school, which was meaning that my, my work was more done in the mornings and the afternoons, and I was home then. Um, or, or like all my office work, I would just do from home. I wouldn't do it anywhere else, but only from home. Um, actually, I just had a phase of about two years, two and a half years. Um, I had a, a phase in the middle where I was doing more creative work, more performance work again. And then from 2017 and a half, like 2018, 2019, I, did, I, re- I created work, but I was never in it myself. I don't like being in my own pieces. Um, 
And this year, suddenly, funny enough, in the corona time, I'm having a boom again um, and really f- feel called to perform again. So mm. I'm going to go for it next this year and next year. I mean, if we can perform, I don't know. But I'm definitely creating and I'm um, in full training. And um, so um, I am actually really enjoying it and just thankful to um, have made this landmark of 50. And I feel, wow. I knew I would love to be 50 and I love it. <laughs> So what is, what is your actually uh, routine now? Like, what do you do for your own training? Um, I make it very practical. So um, all these get lovely guests come. Um, you also, every as far as far as I can get you here, um, come to Sozo and they they um, they are doing the trainings. And so when the guests are here, I'm teaching less, and I'm normally doing. Uh, a contemporary class with the even the first year students I mean that's absolutely fine for me for my body and my age to do a first year contemporary lesson is great I I work more on the alignment and energy flow and being soft with my body and um, I don't necessarily need to learn all the acrobatic cr- tricks that the the others do even though I quite like it um, I love to do ballet still a ballet training um, in between like spot I teach it a lot so I I, I think the muscles and um, the articulation of my ankles feet uh, my my jumping power it, it stays trained in that sense um, because ballet is just great for jumping um, are you still running up the hill in Kassel <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah or biking up it but um yeah, I had a, actually a year and a half ago, I, I got a frozen shoulder, which was very strange for me. It's one of the worst injuries I've ever had. Um, yeah, suddenly my, my, my shoulder started groaning at me and I don't think I took enough care and one day it froze. So it just said to me, no. Um, I haven't had a, an injection for over 15 years, or 20 years, I think it was the last time I let a doctor inject anything into me and I had to have an injection to um, just for this first three days to just get enough mobility that it could begin then to to heal. And it really took one and a half years to heal. Um, but yeah, mainly I'm, I'm uh, taking very good care of uh, diet and um, a balance of diet and fitness. And um, yeah, it, I actually lo- like to take care of myself in those things much more than... Um, um, yeah, much more that I mean, of course, it's become very important to me, put it that way. Yeah, very, very important to me. Yeah, I guess that the, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just 37, but I already started to feel that many things needs more time. Mm-hmm. And I guess it's just going to become more, yeah. <laughs> yeah. more present, no? Yeah, but it actually fulfills me with a lot of pleasure and a lot of, um, oh, I'm very thankful that I can still move in the way I can move or do so much. Um, and it actually, like the relationship I have, have to my body is, is, is that it, it is there. It's, it's not me in that sense, but I live, I live in it. And as long as I keep taking care of it, um, I mean, the, the, the year I de-sugared myself and, um, you know, I just like little steps or taking more care of my sleep. That's my biggest project at the moment. I think that's the most difficult one for me to crack is sleep. Yeah. I'm a bit, still a bit hyperactive and um, it's very difficult for me to shut down. You, you mean to, to make breaks from work or literally to sleep at mm, night? I, I don't suffer from a sleep disorder. I, if, if I, my head's on the pillow, I sleep. <laughs> but it's to get from here to there and to get the head on the pillow that's the, <laughs> that's the challenge yeah, that's the challenge yeah and i actually realize now i really need more than six hours it has to be seven to eight hours and then i'm functioning really well and if i go a few nights and i'm a bit naughty and uh, goes down to five four or five then um i really notice i just cannot do it for more than two or three nights it's like i really feel a, a, a strong um bodily but also a mental um it's like an alarm in me i just like oh deborah be careful this is like it's like walking on a tightrope on the days after that really because i have so much to think about so much to keep on top i like to be on top of things physically and mentally 
Um, I like to be aware. I like to notice things. I like to go into the school and to notice if somebody needs me um, and not to, um, not to have not noticed it. And then suddenly someone's there three weeks later having a crisis or something, you know, and I've not been there for them. Nice. Deborah, I wanted to, to ask you something that I guess you will probably have interesting thoughts about because you've been seeing so many people passing through as you said, uh, 54 people have already been graduate, have already graduated from Sozo. And, and what, what are your thoughts about the relation between physical training and character build up? Like, how, how do you see the, the two? Because of course, I think that dance training, although it's not maybe the most extreme physical training that I can imagine in comparison to certain, let's say professional uh, athletes, mm -hmm. But there is a lot of, uh, of observation about patterns and, and about uh, uh, also internal things. And, and I'm curious, what, what, do you, what do you see? Where do you see this, these two things meeting? Mm -hmm. like we are training on the body, but there's also something happening mm -hmm. on the emotional level. And how, yeah. how do you see this? Um, connections? Yeah, I think we, are, we make ourselves very vulnerable every day. And... Um, I also make myself vulnerable every day when I go into the building. Um, for me, for me also, it's a very fine line of when do, when do I really have to say uh, no or, um, Hey guys, um, I know I want you to be self, your own person and to organize things and to take initiatives. But at the moment I just feel I need to put a framework up just for this specific thing. I can't really think of any examples right now. Um, because mainly I don't want to do that. So um, the first year is very important for the group, I feel. And I spend a lot of time with the first year. And I spend a lot of time with the third years um, in, the, in their last semester. Like at the moment, I'm not really seeing the third years that much. I'm, I'm every day with the first years in one sense or another. Either it's just their ballet class or I'm teaching them also contemporary or they're, um, they're coming to me for the Kung Fu lesson. Um, and are you I mean, based. Yeah, sorry. sorry. Are you are, are you trying uh, actively to 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 guide people through that, or do you mm. somehow trust that okay, I'm offering physical training and the internal lesson will be learned? Like, what is your approach to that? Um, I consider myself a host, so. I have a school and people can be a, a guest in this family, like they can be a, a very, very welcome guest in this family or a member of the family for the time they're there. And um, for me, hosting is the same, like where if I, the minute I begin a class, I'm hosting people in a space in the studio. So the tone of my voice, if the first thing I just say, oh, let's uh, first exercise is, or if I say good morning, um, it all makes a difference to how they are learning to gauge the situation. Are, if I'm sensitive to the, the atmosphere, they also become sensitive to the atmosphere. If I ignore what is in the room, they may also ignore what is in the room. I guess a, a very soft way of trying to be a good example or trying to be the best example I think I could be of um, teamwork, um, being empathic uh, to the other people in the space, to being aware of the other people in the space, to being aware of the space. How do I treat the space? How do I treat the people in the space? How do I, uh, yeah, what is my level of gratitude? Uh, wh where am I, where do I let, um, do I let, uh, um, um, challenges arise and yes I do I allow challenges to come up in the in the in the um, in the classes which I've realized even more and more important over the years I'm actually quite a harmony per, like a harmony bedürftig you say mm. in Germany like I kind of like harmony <laughs> but I've actually realized um, that I ha that part of me has to really disappear sometimes um, and I have to step back and not jump in and save people from their own dilemmas, save people from their own challenges, from their own group experiences. So I'm learning more and more um, with every day how to do that. And I, I, I think their characters, um, 
it's just like in a, it's like to do it in a safe place because actually I'm still there if if something would get really mean or really uh, or really not really unbearable either for the group or the the person themselves um, and, and, and it never really goes that far anyway and 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 one when when you're in the you're teaching a group of people who who came in for you know their their dreams to be to become artists to to learn about their bodies and um and how do you handle the you said the like that you're you're kind of a harmony type but how do you handle competitiveness because i guess like mm. from my own experience being a guest in your school it's not such a competitive place but nevertheless like i think that it's inevitably there at a certain level so what what do you what what is your thought on that like because also you grew up in i guess in the most competitive space imaginable the the royal uh, academy of ballet in london i guess there is no more competitive dance atmosphere mm. one can imagine so mm. what do you what what do you what do you how do you cultivate it in your own space yeah I think competitiveness has uh, positive and negative sides of it. And I think um, trying to get everything positive out of it is a great thing. And anything that would destroy creativity, destroy your personality, destroy uh, your growth. For me, I would say, I think this is a, 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 a filter, a filtering of um, maybe, maybe we can just call it healthy and non-healthy competition. I don't know. For me, it's not actually the competition uh, the word competitiveness is more uh, compares, comparing. Um, I really don't see any sense that we compare ourselves to others. And that's very, it's very, it's like there's a fine line between enjoying healthy competition. Like healthy competition is for me, um, watching your colleagues go f over the space, doing this really difficult, um, I don't know, combination that the teacher just said, and really um, flying through all the acrobatic elements or the one on um, getting the balance on the one leg or, or hitting the music or whatever the task is. And you wishing yourself, like looking at this in that moment, thinking, wow, if I can catch it from someone, I want to catch that. Yeah. And then it positively spurning you on to go and get it. Yeah. Or partnering someone or doing a, a, a partner, either if it's like you observe me, I observe you. Or if it's actually a physically partnering exercise, like in Kung Fu, I really find this that to push somebody so that it's still that they feel challenged and out of their comfort zone, but you don't break them. These are all great things for me, which are um, that are going in the direction of like a, a healthy competitiveness in that sense. So I, um, why I love Kung Fu actually, and I love sparring. Um, but it's not something that breaks you in that sense. Yeah. And how can you build a character that learns not to be broken if somebody's better than you or somebody did it higher or more turns or whatever? How can you find the acceptance that you are where you are? And they are where you are. It doesn't mean that tomorrow cannot be different. It, it's for me the small steps, the small steps. And why? And why do you put an emphasis on the moment you start to compare as kind of the cross, the border to crossing into the let's say negative competitiveness? Yeah. yeah. So the negative space would be the self-talk in the in the um, in your own. So it's it's actually it's about yourself and your own self-talk. So I know that I've had a lot of negative self-talk when I used to be in the ballet school because you would just look at people and think, I will never be like that. I'm too fat or um, uh, my shoulder joints are not made for ballet or my feet are shit or whatever it is. Um, and you don't, it, it stops you because you don't get past it. And if it's, whenever you get to that moment where it's stopping you, where, you, where it brings you out of a flow, um, of moving on to the next day, um, somehow coming to some kind of negotiation with yourself that you can accept the moment for what it is and know that it doesn't need to stay there. Yeah. But I think a lot of young people, it's just a learning experience. I think when you're, when you're our age, you look back and you think, ah, yeah, I could deal with, I could deal with many competitive, uh, experiences now in the studios or, um, I, 
I went through a, a strong phase just a few years ago, actually. It was like when um, Facebook really boomed with everybody putting their classes and stuff on, 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 um, on social media. And because I'm somebody who's chosen to stay at home and teach, so I'm not like I've not traveled as a guest teacher like you have. So nobody knows Deborah smith as a contemporary teacher or a ballet teacher or a Kung Fu teacher. Um, I only had the one experience now in, in a university in Austria to teach there for six semesters. Um, it was very, very enriching for me. Um, I did realize that I am, I, I, I created Sozo to invest in it and I actually just prefer investing there. Um, and I don't, I went through this whole ego trip then of finally getting away from Sozo, having my ego uh, tickled somewhere else <laughs> and being like, I think you said in the, in your last podcast with, with Tom, uh, the cool guest, the one with the new dish um, and getting that lovely feedback and, and um, like pat on the back and uh, coming to me after class with loads of questions and um, asking for my music or, or whatever it is. Yeah. My philosophy or why I, why I teach like I teach um, enjoying my feedback. Um, and I realized actually I was just giving there in this university, the same as what I give in Sozo and in a university that is maybe bigger and more um, not so personal, maybe it was something refreshing on you. Yeah. But I realized, no, I have to bring it back home. I have to stay here at home and, um, and do this here. Um, and I, I want, yeah. so, sorry, I want to, I want to start, try to peel a little bit more deep into yeah. your thoughts because I find it extremely interesting. First, this differentiation between like, like, like this, the comparison as the, as the, as the one factor that can drop you into a negative space. But what are your thoughts? Because we are living in a very visual world, like, and especially I think like, you know, social media has a big role on it, but this is something that I guess was all, already present in, in the dance world pre-social media era that, mm -hmm. you know, like a, your teacher is coming and, and, and teaching you and, and, and we are still very based on demonstration as a, as a tool for teaching. So you get an example of something that you should aspire to. So you already have this reference, uh, this external reference that is not your body. And you look at it and this, this reference is there to show you where you should go. So in a way, it's kind of inevitable that you will compare yourself to a certain degree mm. because, because you, you, you get this reference. Mm. But, but I know that it, you're not always in this negative space. So even in, maybe even in this comparison, there is a certain maybe different ways of comparing yourself or what would you say about it? You mean the students to the teacher or the to, the, to, to the, the role middle, role model? Yeah, to, mm -hmm. to the role model, because this, you know, like when you said mm -hmm. like, oh, my, my shoulder is not for ballet, my feet is not for ballet. It doesn't have to be with your colleagues. It can also be with the, with the person that is, that is there teaching you. And, and, and so I think like that to a certain degree, it's kind of inevitable, the comparison. So how, how you prevent going to this slippery mm -hmm. slope of, you know, of, yes. of internal, yeah. internal voice. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's detailed work actually. Um, I enjoy having small classes and I think having classes of like eight to 12 people, is kind of like a nice number. You have a, a group energy, but you can still catch these things. So if I notice a student is really frustrated with their hips because their hips, <laughs> they just, they are not made for ballet. Um, actually I'm always teaching with the point of me and my body. So I, the starting point is me and my body is learning this. Me and my body will find a solution to this problem. I mean, we are, we are the, the greatest, uh, dancers are the greatest solution, solution uh, fin finders, yeah? Um, if you think how quickly we recognize a, a, a problem in our body where something is not flowing or the balance doesn't work or um, the, the, the joint is blocked because we, we forget to op keep it open or um, we don't know yet how to open it. Um, I think that that's what teaching is. We give the, the students ideas. Now, I, I, I'm also not a physiotherapist, even though I'm very interested in, in anatomy. Um, I think we, we, we give them, we, we have to make them curious enough that they find it out themselves, that they know, or that I say, I trust you to, to find it out. I can give you this picture. 
I can put hands on. I can um, show you another body as a, as a, as a comparison <laughs> to say this one, this shoulder, this type of shoulder would function like this or um, yours is a bit more like this. So it's a bit like mine because it's hung on forwards or, um, and I think um, just talking about it, just there's no taboo thing to have something that doesn't function. It's, um, it's actually, um, as Ryan Holiday, I don't know if you know the book, The Ob Obstacle is the Way. <laughs> yeah. Um, that every, the obstacle is the learning pro, it is the thing that is needed. Yeah. For each and every one of us. And there is no obstacle that cannot be broken in half, gone round the left side, gone round the right side, jumped over or dug a hole and gone under. Or you go through it. Yeah. Bruch test. Like, Kung Fu it. <laughs> so I mean <laughs> I mean there's the, the explosive, sneaky, um what with whatever energy you want to deal with your obstacles, there is the next one will be there. That's why we learn with every obstacle that there will be another obstacle. And you the the big the the, the smallest obstacles are just preparing you to get over the bigger ones. And then you learn later in life actually the, the bodily obstacles are not the big ones. It's more these ones that are the, the more difficult ones. So, so would you say that to a certain degree, it's kind of inevitable that you go into the studio and you go through the same mistakes that everybody does with being frustrated about your body and being frustrated about all the things you cannot do. And then, you know, 20 years later, you recognize, oh, actually, I have a, everything is OK. Or, or there is a way because I don't know, like I still find your school specifically uh, that the students there are 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 not so uh, yeah they are more open to learning mm. from other places I've been so so yeah so I think it's not like there is a certain inevitability but still there is something special that you've managed to create there when it comes mm. to appreciation of learning or mm. yeah I believe also in the in the beginner spirit in the spirit of a beginner and um, approaching every day fresh. I mean, when I think back of um, starting this school in 2007, and since then, I mean, I've done the program <laughs> more than anyone else, <laughs> not as a student, of course, I know it's a bit different, but I've been in the space and the amount of stuff I have learned there and that I still will probably carry on learning is just amazing. Um, and I'm thankful for every, every bit of it. And I think um, nowadays, um, I mean, I guess Sozo is also a place, it's not churning out dancers for state theatres necessarily. They, the, 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 that, that type of dancer can come to Sozo, can flourish and get pushed to their maximum and go and get a, a job in the state theatre. We have it happening every year, a few times, yeah. Um, it, most of the time, I think our atmosphere is really encouraging that the growth of the inner artist and that's what we are preaching also, or not preaching, but um, um, we do a lot of composition from day one. So um, composition is like the third leg um, with um, performing and technic technical work. Um, so it becomes very important to keep, to stay creative. And I think that takes the mind of only treating yourself as a machine. Um, and I think that's why most of the guests also that I'm inviting are, are artists that are also not just technical machines, but they're also creating, they're curious in life, they're still um, lifelong learners. Um, and I think this has a, yeah, I think it's also the, ch the choice of guests coming makes a big difference also because they're the role models. Um, and I think actually the students, um, they have also some kind of, input like they suggest people or um we have for instance these visions day where we we talk about the uh, the, the the type of teaching or the the curating of the, i call it the curating of the school year because i feel i curate a school year i don't just ring people and stick them in the calendar and da, da, da. so it's like really thinking i always do it the whole year you know in a one in a oneness so that that school year feels like a, a whole a whole um mm -hmm course in that sense um and not just bashing through weeks of a youth, uh, an education in that sense actually maybe it's a little bit leading me to another topic that i wanted to 
to ask you about because um, I mean you've done at least from my perspective something really amazing like when when I came to Kassel for the first time and still every time I come to Kassel to teach in your school I'm very excited and, and <laughs> I really enjoy coming there mm. and 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 I think that sometimes when 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 you look at something like this from the outside it can look extremely big and you and you know and I thought to myself wow would I ever be able to do something like this and you know then you maybe start doubting yourself and maybe you can share a little bit like you know you, you how to cultivate this kind of spirit of 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 making your vision comes mm -hmm. into reality maybe you can tell a little bit like how how did it actually happen like how did you mm -hmm. yeah, how did from from an idea did it came to a point that now we talk mm -hmm. uh, so many years later about you know the, the routines mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. um naivety <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think uh, it's become a very precious thing. I mean, of course, I'm not as naive as I was in 2006 <laughs> when I was uh, heavily pregnant and going to all the offices to get things signed and to do business plans and stuff. And I'm also, I didn't learn business. So um, I think with every vision people have, it, if you feel I mean, this is very like maybe a bit more um, intuitive, uh, talking about intuition. Um, but I really felt called to leave the theater, to leave opera house work and theater being in a company as a machine, um, to create something myself. And my first wish was to actually just have a company, to have a small company. And I didn't even learn anything about choreography. It's like, I'm not really the, the great choreographer, but I enjoy doing it. And um, I thought about this small company and then I thought, oh, Deborah, you are just so naive. I mean, how can you just leave your job at a theater and then pay dancers? Like you want seven dancers or something? I'm like, where do you get the money? You believe in paying dancers uprightly. And, um, and then my thoughts just, I, I remember sitting there and daydreaming. I'm a daydreamer. I need a lot of daydreaming time. Um, right side of the brain, that kind of thing. I'm also interested very much in this brain, how the brain functions. But um, yeah, I remember thinking, okay, so but what would these dancers look like? Like how how would you work with them? What would the work atmosphere feel like? Or how how would the teamwork feel like? Or and I remember just thinking, wouldn't it be interesting to form a, a community, an educational community where everybody is learning? Um, and that from out of this education, so like I, I educate my own dance artists in that side, I, I, or I teach people to be the kind of dancers that I would love to work with. That sounds really stupid. That is not the, the way I would formulate oh, actually, it, actually. It, actually, it doesn't sound stupid at all. <laughs> okay. Because I think if you want to work with people creative, creatively, then I'm personally not interested in just having an, 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 an auditions. Anonym. Yeah. yeah. Um, I know this fits for many kinds of works and it's actually maybe good to have a less personal um, thing for the work or I don't know, for a certain framing. Um, so I'm not like bashing that at all. Um, I just know that um, for me, after all those years in the theatre, I thought, okay, if I'm going to make art or if I'm going to make work creatively with people, it's going to be, it has to be fulfilling. I want to go home and be fulfilled from the relationships, from working with young people. I really feel also called to be with this generation from 20 to 30. So anyway, back to your question. Um, I sat there and I thought, how would it be? Yeah, and so the idea was born, um, create an education. So I started doing business plans or just writing ideas down. And from that time till two years later, the school opened. It, actually, it was really amazing because actually up till the school opened, I hardly hit any bureaucracy. So like can I, I can I can I jump in? I want to yeah. ask you something because like first the first thing you said, uh, which made me laugh, but the, about naivety, <laughs> uh, it's remind it, it reminded me actually. Uh, I have a friend here in Vienna who study business management, and and we once walked on the street, and he told me like you see all these shops, it's like it's like crazy that people go and like open these businesses, and he said like that he thinks that in order to open the business you need to be if you're too aware, you, you, you know the risk, you will never 
you will never open. If you're completely unaware, you will you will probably fail very quickly, and you need to be in a certain line that kind of you have naivety and and like this ability to 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 imagine, to daydream, but also certain connected like groundness to make mm-hmm. it happen. So, uh, so what what was the other side? Like so, and I think that in the like creative people have easy time of daydreaming and imagining things. But what I think a lot of people are struggling with that have visions is how to bring them into reality. So like, mm-hmm. can you share a bit what, what, what did help you to, yeah. to, to actually, yeah. what was the, to, to do the first steps? Hmm. Um, I think I'm, I, I don't need the secure, I don't, I don't need security. Uh, like, of course we all need a certain level of security, but I'm not somebody who gets scared about not having much money or, um, um, I'm very willing to take a risk for the sake of having something in my life or actions in my life, helping other people, um, investing in other people, investing in in situations which are full of creativity and bringing people to another place. Um, it's my passion. And so I think if the passion is big enough, um, I, I, even though I can't say that people who are scared to take the step are not full of passion that I wouldn't say. Um, but I definitely, I definitely realized that for me, I, I have, I, I have, um, somehow I must have the ability to, to put fears aside and to say, um, what the heck, just go for it, just do it, see what happens. And then I get all excited with every risk I take because I, um, I just think, Hey, I can move something. I can, I, I can move something. I can really move something in society. I can move something in a young person's life. I can, I can create, um, or I can initiate that something can be created. I can, like my artwork is not that I stand there and, um, I don't even show steps mostly because I, because of coming out of classical ballet, I don't force my physicality on the people who are moving for me. Even though maybe I would like to try that again in the future. I don't know. It's a bit like more old, fa- not old fashioned, but it's like, that's the way I was doing things with choreographers. But um, I think uh, I, I mainly like to create with a group, the group of people I do. I'm not really, it's not really totally democratic how I'm working as a choreographer, but it's more like um, I, gave, I give enough framework that there is freedom in there, but I'd make the last decision. So I, so tie when, things when together you a, when you have a vision for, and, and and like it can you know you know you 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 have been ma- making so many things like artwork uh, your your school so so there is the place of the of the of the visioning but uh, do you take also times to like like you know a lot of uh, let's say uh, uh, coaches will you know will start telling you you have to write your goals and to make little tasks like do you work like this at all or you have a completely different approach i've tried i've tried that because i've done a lot of business coaching courses and how did it um, work? And, and and i've dived into that world the whole entrepreneurship world and all the the big wiggies that you should follow and having a daily plan and having things sorted before you go to bed and um having a morning ritual and all this stuff i mean like i know very deeply dived dive into all that. And I think um, I've tried out many things. I've done like morning pages uh, from the artist's way and um, not looking at social, not looking at my emails until after my teaching is done at, at midday. And I go through phases. I do what thought fits to me. Yeah. Um, for me, moving every day is important. And uh, the family meal in the evening um, so I cook every evening and uh, unless my husband's in the theater in a, in a evening sh- sh- shift, um, we're, we're eating with our teenage daughter every evening for an hour at the table, um, which is, uh, which for, for me, things like that are really important. And then I realized that that really gives me the, the other side of the coin to go back to my work, um, to, to really g- break off from it. So you, um, so you feel like that's all the- I mean, that's, I mean, I, I think I have a bit less experience, but I also started in the, like I made uh, my first marketing course a few years ago after realizing that even though I'm an artist and a dancer, I have to know something about business management. Uh, but 
but I've, I've, the way I've experienced it, like that there is a lot of, you know, it's a kind of very dogmatic world, no? Like there is, there, there yes. are the people who succeed and, and, and kind of lay a certain path, as you said, like of how to do things. Mm. And, and I've also experienced positive result with doing things in a certain way that I would not do in, in, in intuitively. Mm. Uh, but, but on the other hand, I also feel like that there is something about the nature of creative spirit that kind of goes in, into a direct conflict with these dogmas yeah. of how yeah. to be. Yes. And, and like how, so did you develop kind of your own way of being in an interpreter? Would you, like yeah, yeah. I, I think, um, I mean, I was willing, uh, again, I went into all these courses or to these webinars, to these um, also registered courses, learning for myself how to, uh, going through modules of things. Um, and I don't regret doing them at all. In fact, I really see them in the last five years as being really, uh, no, it was like three or four years, um, as being growing spurts for me. And also having another, ch it's also an update because I, I feel my, 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 um, um, I didn't grow up with a phone. Yeah. So I got my first phone when I was like 35. So it's like, I've been, a since 15 years, I have a phone. Yeah. A, like a, a, a mobile phone. Whereas my daughter, for instance, she knows it since she goes to, since she is 11, 12. Yeah. Because she goes to a school where she travels with the bus now and, um, and then I see other people, the kids are, not, so I, I have a slight, um, I, I don't know, I, sometimes I consider our generation the lucky one being between, between the, I think it's like the one after baby, generation X or something, I think I'm, I'm in, <laughs> but um, it's like you still remember enough of the stuff, analog, uh, really doing things with your hand, writing things down, um, being very practical with things hands on and and the generation that is now where it's a lot of media digital uh, digital way of doing things they can take their they, they just look at apps and stuff and they know how to to do it whereas I have to uh, read in a bit um, and when I started Sozo I was 35 36 and my, I was just like six years older than the oldest student. Now I'm 50 and I could be the oldest student's mother. So it's, uh, it's really, um, it's changed a lot. And I feel just in those 15 years, my relationship to the students, and it is something that I just keep wanting to work on and stay open to. What difference does it make to the school when the school director is not in touch with enough with the generation that is coming through the school. Um, that's why I like spending time with the students. I like drinking coffee with them, having tea time with them, chatting with them in the lounge downstairs while they're in the breaks. Um, I like being around. I like being in the back of the class, training for myself and just observing them. Uh, it helps me get in touch with what they are going through, what they're feeling. I can, I can, I can empathize more with their situations. And, and and does this in a way also uh, feeds your let's say the visions for the future? Um, yes. This kind of real connection yes. with the people yeah. you are with. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've been through a lot of um, a lot of ups and downs with the with the school in the sense of um, irregular attend uh, uh, irregular maybe number of students in the school which um either you have a good a good a good year where you can afford to do more in the school or uh, uh, with less students you can afford to do less um it doesn't 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 make a difference for the quality i think as long as the students are grateful for everything and are open to just getting the best out of what is there in that year um but I did learn a couple of things in these business things to be clearer with the vision. So what it did help me to do is to take my vision that I had a long time ago, again, newly under, under a, a microscope and to like almost reword it, refresh it, um, look at what has not even been used or done and either to cut it off or to um, it was like more, it was like fine streaming it a bit, but staying, still st trying to stay open. Um, as I say, we have different kinds of students here. So 
from state theater type dancers to freelance installative artists who are doing conceptual work and everything in between. Um, and I actually like it like that. Um, and then there, there was some, some themes coming up over the years, if it would not be good that we, st we decide what, what are we a school for and to streamline it to that. Um, and I actually, I didn't want to streamline it into just high level physicality, but I did change the way the audition happens for Sozo so that we didn't, so that it wasn't so easy for just anybody to get to an audition kind of thing that, um, I could see more video material before or a bit more character, uh, um, uh, from motivation, um, that I could read into it a bit more. And that actually in, in the year I did that, um, we doubled our intake. Yeah. Cause normally we were taking eight to 10 students and then suddenly we had 17. Yeah. Um, so actually I was happy to do that. It was, it was a good exercise for me not to be wishy-washy with something, but to respect my own vision in that way, to have respect for, for, for the thing itself. Mm. And because there, there, is a, there is a sentence I've seen in your website that, that I think that it's interesting, maybe connected in, in a way, maybe you can yeah. uh, clarify it a little bit more, that you, you, you wrote to be stubborn on the vision, but flexible on the details. So, so yeah. how, what did you mean and how did you apply it in the context of the school? Is this what you mean that, that like, that okay experiencing who is coming to the school and then adapting a little bit what your exact vision was in a certain way mm -hmm. and, and and like letting yeah. it become a new vision or like how do you do this process of reality check versus yeah. vision yeah i think uh, the 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 vision is is not just is actually bigger than what type of dancer are we uh, are we um, uh, producing in that sense through the education? It's more the vi the vision of Sozo, and this is where I'm very very stubborn. Is it's it's what Sozo means, which I also wrote this little thing there that um, Sozo is. Um, it's like, actually, I, 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 I re, we are, the school is called Visions in Motion. And lately I've just been calling everything I do is, 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 um, is uh, within the Sozo zone. So a zone is a place where you experience a certain kind of thing that you don't experience maybe outside of the zone. So you can come into the zone. Um, doesn't necessarily mean you need to be in our studios. Um, experiencing something from Sozo is maybe um, enough to feel something of the spirit of what we do yeah and that um sozo means a place that where you can be uh, safe where something can unfold where um where uh, things can be re renewed or made whole in that sense even though i mean something can never be perfect but it's just the that's the the idea of it and i think it fits very well to to becoming a creator to becoming a the the I think we're all born to create and to support each other somehow. And they're the most fulfilling things um, to create something that helps someone mm. is for me, something so fulfilling in life. And I can't imagine doing anything else. I wouldn't want to really create something that didn't help someone um, in that sense. And that doesn't mean to say that watching my piece on the stage helps you, <laughs> But the whole process of the situation of the rehearsals with the dancers helped each and every one of those people who worked with me over those months. Um, that's what I mean in that sense. So I'm very stubborn with this vision and flexible on the details of, that's like the obstacles that are there every day. It can be a bureau, bureaucratical uh, obstacle. It can be the, the pandemic that is this huge thing now, like um, how do we train? Um, do we have to wear a mask? Do we not have to wear a mask? Um, what do I really believe or not believe? And all this stuff. Um, the new first year turns out to, like this group just comes and it's there. That's it. Those people, I chose them. I, with, with also not just me alone, but the, the, the other teachers, we saw them, we talked about them. We thought, okay, yes. And, wow, what a diverse group and it's going to be fantastic. And I get all excited about this new group every year. And um, yeah, and then you start seeing the little obstacles because uh, the personalities unfold and the, the longer you spend with somebody, we all know this, the longer you spend 
int intimately with other people in a space, the more you get to know about them and they also about me. Um, I think it's, um, I think that's the flexibility in that sense that um, I can be flexible on details like, ah, how do we present something on the website? Yeah. Or um, in the visions day where we are, we're conversing on how to um, either get, get around, make a, find a good solution for maybe something we find problematic in the school or something we think we could do better. Um, then of course I'm flexible on the details because actually I'm interested in what the students think. So it's like not, I don't force my, my detail. Yeah, but I listen, I listen. I mean, there's one thing, I love this book from Simon Sinek called um, Eat, Leaders Eat Last. Um, and he explains in the, in the book um, uh, that uh, Nelson, Nelson Mandela what used, grew up in, in, a, in, in his, his culture and his father used to be a chief of, of the tribe. And they always used to sit in a circle, like never a frontal with somebody at the front and everybody sitting. So it was always a circle. And his father said, I have these rules. We always sit in a circle and I always speak last. And um, things, just small things like this um, do affect the way I work, that we, we gather in a circle every morning. The gong from our nice dojo rings and we sit there and we do a three-minute meditation together. Um, and then we've, we've just experience this three minute silence together with people you're going to maybe meet in studios um that's like all three classes together and then we separate into the studios and um go off and this isn't compulsory there are students that um like to like creep in creep in the door and not come to the meditation i'm not i'm not dogmatic about that because i find i just offer it you know and so a lot of the students love this kind of way of working and then i have the few that are that the ones on the on the outskirts that that are not conforming in that sense. And I don't want them to have to conform. That's a great thing about it. Yeah, I can yeah. offer. <laughs> no, this is really a beautiful way of, of managing the tension because I think like, what, and that it's important you know, to enable people to exist also on the margins when it comes to, you know, like the, the, the group behavior and, and like what are the norms. Hmm. But when you said that, that, that uh, because I find I find it for myself very difficult to have to be stubborn on the vision, you know, like because because I, I I had so many visions that that you know that I pushed so much to make it real, and then when it when it became real, I recognized, wow, what have I done? It's not what it's not where I want to be, and, and then you know I, I had to kind of change my vision, and 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 and, I, and while I'm hearing you, I'm thinking like maybe if you're stubborn of, on the wrong thing, then when it, it will unfold and you would recognize it and you will have to, to adapt as well. But did, mm -hmm. do you have a feeling like that something stayed from, you know, like from the, from the initial, from the initiation of the process and that you can recognize now 13 years later and say like, well, I still feel the same hardcore deep yes. there. Yeah. Yes, yes, definitely. Definitely. Um, that has stayed with me. And um, I do have an example, though, of one of the visions that you are talking about. And that was the, the, the break to go and teach in a university. And the first season there was so successful for me that I found myself following this ego trip to get really successful there and invest even more in it. And to and in the end, after three years, I just had to think, no, it's not, it's not really me. It's not where I want to be, actually. And I don't think it's where I can be. Um, yeah. So th 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 that's a similar example, maybe, of somewhere where I got, I, I, I swifted off a little bit uh, on, a, on, a, on a side thing. Um, I'm not saying, it, it, I mean, it was a fantastic experience and I learned a lot and um, I very grateful to the colleagues there and um i also met a lot of great colleagues who come to zozo now for as guests sometimes and um yeah so i i think everything's a learning experience but to come to this point where you said uh, of recognizing um before it's too late maybe i will try to get back onto something where i know this is where my heart is 
and um, I actually remember having the conversation with you where you decided to stop traveling so much um, and to uh, invest in your family and uh, really Matan I mean my hat off to you because I can I mean I, I I've leaving my family one week every month for for the university was also not easy in that sense it was a lot to to cope with and uh, Zoe coming into just beginning to be a teenager so, so I'm I'm actually glad that I've also decided to come back to my family Sozo family and my 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 uh, family family yeah there, there is something you mentioned before that uh, uh, you said that uh, that you really enjoy helping others and and there's another great sentence that I read in your website that you 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 wrote that you, you question why there is so many self help books and and there is not more uh, help had others literature so mm -hmm. so wh why do we, why do you think what wh what is the why is it important for you and what kind of a quality you're cultivating by by mm -hmm. engaging in in being there for other people hmm. um yeah it's not that i've never ever used a self-help book myself or read into some theme that i was working on whether it's been uh, nutrition or um mindset changing somehow or um but I, the market is just so big and it gets, very, it's almost very, you can, to work on yourself, you can buy anything, but to learn to empathize and help other people, um, there's not really anything. I mean, I don't think we really need books for this, to be honest. <laughs> um, I think we're made, we're, we're, we're made to have relationships and to, um, to have rich relationships. And I think, um, rich relationships are listen like listen first or understand others and then be understood um may maybe you need some a certain level of maturity to understand that because i know as a young person i always wanted to justify myself i wanted people to understand me and why i did certain things i was a very big justifier um and actually until one colleague of mine in the th in the theater one day she said to me deborah you're always justifying yourself and I was like, well, she's right. And in one point, it had something to do with my eating disorder um, that made me habit, habitually try to always justify everything I did so people would think I was perfect from outside. Um, and on the other hand, um, realizing all the lies in my head that I was telling myself about me and my body and, my, and, and that this eating disorder actually didn't really belong to me. Um, and that, and that once I was free of this helping myself, uh, that helping others was just so, so pleasurable. And I was free to do it because I didn't have to think about myself all the time. It's interesting. I, I, I have a, a good friend uh, is an, um, also busy with movement. He's an Aikido teacher. And, and, and he told me that, he, that, that there is like that there is a, a, a big lie or or some hypocrisy in this kind of culture of self-improvement and mm. and invest in yourself da, da, da. And, and he said like that for him the the only way to improve the self is by stop concentrating on the self and starting to concentrate on others yes and in a way when you mentioned me stopping uh, deciding not to to tour and to focus on my family i think it, it related to this started a process mm. in me uh, to put my my aspiration for my own life aside in order to focus on on other people that were sorry, the closest people to me in my life yeah. uh, and in a way i feel it it already it's also unfolding right now in the moment that i'm here hosting you and i'm here for you and i want to hear you out and, mm. and and give you the stage to to be who you are and 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 yeah and i wonder and, and i wonder uh with uh, where do you feel the, the this kind of need for self-expression and and in, in relation to to the you know the ability to hold the space for others because i think that not every self-expression expression is driven by ego i mean definitely no. the ego is there but like 
what is your way to, to wh how do you, when do you recognize, yes, I need now time for myself. Now it's mm. enough with others. Mm. Um, that's the point. That's why I stay in a dance artist myself. So I'm not a school director. I am a school director. I am a school director who is still a working dance artist, whether she is choreographing or dancing herself. So um, I have to keep myself fit. So I have a training for myself every day. Wow, that's great. I mean, my students are there also in the room and I actually love that, um, but I'm there for myself. So um, I remember you coming to teach for the first time and I asked you if I could do your classes. <laughs> and you didn't tell me till afterwards that you were nervous the first time. <laughs> But um, yeah, so everybody gets used to now. They know they come to Sozo. Oh, Deborah, do will do my class. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it's so funny. I realized... From your perspective, you... Sorry, from your I'm totally, you... I'm totally loose with it. I, I yeah, you, it's for you, me, you, nothing. Yeah. <laughs> you forget uh, what's your role in there. <laughs> yeah, I forget. I'm not really a school director in that moment. I'm just coming to take a class and I'm so thirsty and I'm so happy that you're giving this great stuff that I'm like with eyes like this at the back of the class. Um, and really diving into this to the stuff and I remember all your sessions with all the great things we did in the first years where you were there uh, more regularly um, all the play fighting and um, having the mats fully out over the dojo and uh, yeah really being able to to um, enjoy our energy yeah um, so please feel free to uh, keep on doing that when you come um, yeah, and I think um, I, I apply for money, I apply for funding, I, I um, have this small company, which is um, the philosophy of the company, which fits to the vision, is um, that I work with people who I've trained. So it's always alumni. I don't work with the students in the school unless I'm, I, I've allocated myself to, to do something for the school performance. But... Um, usually a group of alumni who have graduated a long time ago or just recently you mean in, and, the, in your own creations yes yeah so i work with the with the ex-students with the alumni and um so in a way it's always quite personal i would say no yeah 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 and sometimes they've left castle and they've come back like three years later and they're working with me on a piece um so they've gathered some experience elsewhere um uh yeah so it's it's always really interesting and actually that's just starting to develop more deeply um in the last years so fine fine like, like it's taken that many years like over 10 12 years until it's getting to that point where i'm starting now to feed um from years of investing and being able to pick dancers i like uh movers that i like personalities that i like characters that i like to come and work together sometimes it was just uh, two of them working with me so it, like a me and the, it was a, a duet and until it was like I've worked with seven of them at one time yeah but you always need a lot more dancers the more funding you need so yeah it's funny it's like when you're telling this it's all I, I like the images that are coming to my mind is my father who is a who is a farmer and you know like how much energy he gives to every tree and, and then oh, like, yes. So then you invest so much of yourself and then eventually you can, you can take something back, Obviously. which is a very, very different thing than, than, you yes. know, like just shopping for the yes. fruits. Yes. And, and actually, you know, like the, when I'm hearing you talking, like there's another theme that comes up in my mind that uh, I didn't plan talking with you, but I think it's actually interesting. Like what is your relation to relationship to hierarchies? Because you, you have this incredible ability to, to, to be the director of the school and at the same time, you know, as you say, be on the back and, and you know, suck in some new material with your student uh, and, and be challenged and like place yourself really kind of horizontally next to them. But on the other hand, you know, like you are the school director, mm -hmm. it's very clear. So what's your, what's your feeling about mm -hmm. hierarchies? Yeah, I think that's one of the most difficult parts of my job, if I'm really honest to um, say on the one hand of the students, hey, we're having this visions day and you can make decisions and you will be part of it. And, and on the other hand, in some times I pull in the ropes and say, with this situation, in this moment, I feel I just have to make the, f I, I have to, you know, take the reins again. Um, it doesn't happen that often, but it does happen and I have to do it. Um, and I just have to be able to, I think, um, internally negotiate with myself and be sure about why I then do that. 
to not confuse people with the vision of the school or to what we're actually doing. I was actually very, very um, inspired by the Black Mountain College in the 20s and 30s. And um, that was the school in the North, North Carolina in, in, in America where John Cage and Cunningham came out. It was like they, they inhabited this huge building outside in the country and the professors, the students, they all came to do a, a university level uh, education with each other. But um, there was no uh, there was no um, Stundenplan. There was no. Um, uh, schedule, curriculum upward. schedule yeah so everything was like they lived together they grew vegetables outside they swam in the lake they everybody took dance lessons everybody took music lessons and there were still people working on architecture and so it was very artistic in that way but I was I bought the catalogue of this book there was an exhibition about it in Berlin but um, I was very inspired by this um, actually I'd already started so so but I found out about this college and I read into it a bit, a bit and read all the old letters about how you know, some of the professors even escaped from Nazi Germany to go over there and invest in this college. Um, on the other hand, they lasted exactly 25 years and then it just was done. And in the front of the catalog, it's written, the Black Mountain College uh, was, uh, a fr uh, was the result of certain people in a certain place at a certain time. And this really inspired me because I thought, I never know when Sozo will come to an end. Hmm. I, and, uh, I mean, I don't plan it just to end, but may, you never know. And I always think Sozo Visions in Motion is a very, very special thing. It's very, very special people at a certain time in a certain place. And it cannot re be repeated. So I, I I can be inspired by other things, but it 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 has its own um, it has its own velocity now. It has its own spirit in that sense. And yes, I am pulling some reins, or I'm 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 being stubborn with my with my main part of the vision. Um, but this flexibility of knowing when to say no. For instance, I was reading a great book about no. It's called The Connecting No. <laughs> mm. And every time you really feel you have to say no to something, like it's this whole thing about just saying yes all the time and letting things happen is not really loving um, because it's, um, it's then it doesn't really matter. Everything is just yes. You can do this, you can do this, you can do this. So having a no there makes, makes the yes more, more visible, more um, important, more treasured but also saying no is can also be a measure of safety a measure of um caring in that sense so every time i would say no i try to support it with a yes to my no a yes to myself a yes to the person i'm saying no to and actually it's a relationship it's a relate it's a, a no that creates a deeper level of relationship so that's what i try to hold in mind when i'm i realize yes to not so much hierarchy in the school but in the end yes i am i created it i'm the director and if i let go then it's not it's it lo it does lose something in that sense so when i need to say no to something or yes to something then it like let your no be a no and let your yes be a yes yeah, i feel like in a way for you like for me sorry your your school is a, is somehow a very good example of the balance between recognizing hierarchies and at the same time not being uh, um, slaves of the hierarchies because uh, i mean in the last in the last year and a bit i've been i've been more been pulled into politics and discussions and 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 i've and i think that especially in the in the art world there is a lot of let's say very superficial uh, expression and discussion about non-hierarchical non -hierarchical spaces and we are all equal and, and this kind of, uh, you know, uh, I've heard so many times teachers entering into the room and saying like, I'm not teaching, I'm just facilitating, you know, like this kind of like withdrawal from the responsibility of, 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 of being a leader and actually acknowledging the hierarchy. But on the other hand, you know, like also uh, going into a, I had my my very rigid ballet teacher that you know that, that forced their 
the authority on me and, and, and that's also like pathological. And I think that somehow what you're doing for me represents also a very good example of that, 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 that yes, we can acknowledge that, that, that yeah, you, you have more experience Mm -hmm. and and also you're very competent in what you're doing <laughs> and and therefore you have your role but at the same hand you, you you're not afraid of letting it go and letting others shine next to you and and is it something that you feel that, that is it coming a little bit from what you said in the beginning of the conversation that you're kind of aspiring for harmony or is it something that you've learned with the role mm. of, of leading the school? I think it's something that I've learned with the role because saying no to somebody, you know that it's not going to go through something necessary, a harmonious phase. You're going to discuss again. They maybe come again and give you contra and you have to again support your no um, or your yes, what, 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 whatever it is. There's also um, the noch nicht, so the, the not yet. Yeah, there's this space in between where, where I've also learned that if I say to somebody, let me think about it, that means kind of like, let's let some time, let's negotiate a little bit about this, whatever it, whatever it is. There's this not yet. So not yet means we go through a space where it could become a no and it could become a yes, but um, we don't know yet. So I've learned that the best thing is, is this time doesn't drag on too long because making people wait for a yes or a no is probably one of the worst things you can do to kill an atmosphere or kill a working ethic or moral or um, yeah, the willingness of young people to stay engaged. So um, with ideas that they have and that they want to try out and say, if it was ever this no or this not yet, I always realize the no has to be very clear and supported or the not yet has to have a time frame where they know, okay, we go through this, this and stage of discussion and we know that whatever comes out will be um, will be f have a foundation in that sense. I think you can win win win. It's about winning trust, I think. And I I try to be as transparent. I'm very big on transparency with money, with um, with my my ideas for the future, with uh, engaging people to help me think things through. Um, so. I, I do realize sometimes I'm ahead of people. So like my, my vision inside is like a little bit ahead. And sometimes I forget to keep people on the train with me because I have new ideas all the time. But, um, but in, in Maine, I'm very big on transparency and I, I don't mind being told, Hey, Deborah, you're going too fast. Can we stop and go over that again? And they're like, yes, thank you for stopping me. Best thing you could do. <laughs> I can then rethink it myself because I'm I'm thinking faster than I'm talking, and um, you know this feeling of of being the creative one in that sense, and you're always over I've ahead. Been called by several <laughs> teachers the next step guy, so <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. I have a big problem with that. Yeah. But yeah. besides transparency, are, are, do you have any other like let's say moral codes or like ethics that you're trying to mm. to bring into? Yeah the school and to your life that yeah. in order to negotiate those tensions mm. i think one important thing is not is is not about being right or wrong so as a teacher i have to say ich muss nicht recht haben i don't have to be right i can have an opinion i can share that with you i can even have an experience that worked for me and i can share that with you but it doesn't mean that it's right for you. You have to filter it. So in that sense, I still leave things very much open to people. And for me, that's a good moral to have with students that they don't feel they have. Yeah, because I, I, I don't know, I can't imagine teaching any other way, actually. Um, I mean, maybe there are things I don't really, it's a very big thing. This thing about right and wrong is anyway, a, a, what, what, how do you start a conversation about that? But um, I just realized that's one thing in running the school that is important, that I can always be corrected by someone. That for me, I can show a certain kind of moral in that I am not perfect. I am, don't, I'm not always right. I can admit that I, I do things sometimes wrong or too fast, or I, I can admit to my, my, my imperfectness in that sense. And I can, I'm willing to go into discussion with it, with other people who are maybe the people I'm teaching even, or, um, or other teachers. Um, 
I can, uh, I think, yeah, not having to hold, like, hold face for, like, for, um, against all odds that I have to show that I'm right. Um, that's one thing. I think transparency is another thing in, um, because in, in Sozo, we are completely financed by the students' money. So they pay a, a monthly fee and that is our budget in that sense. We, I rent the studios out a bit to help. Um, and so I'm very, very aware and very, very, I, I mean, uh, humble, humble with money, but I don't, I, I would hate to think that I wasted one cent of what they paid in for their education. So in that sense, that's where I do keep the reins. So I'm, I don't let the control of money go, go somewhere else because I know that I can actually, I'm, I work quite magic with money and, um, and yeah, I have the, I have the, this view of everything. So I'm the, I'm the one with the view, the blick auf der Skanze. So the one that can see all parts of the puzzle, the whole picture. And as long as I, I, I that's my responsibility actually. And I feel that taking that responsibility is also uh, one of the morals that I have to hold up is not forgetting any, any part of that picture. Um, yeah. I mean, it's gone, gone, gone sometimes where other people would say, you don't have to do that. You don't, shouldn't have to share that information. Where I say, well, I don't mind actually sharing it. I don't mind telling the students where the money goes. Mm. It's their money. It's not my school. You know, I'm even saying to them, you know, guys, if you stay, if you're staying one, one day a week at home because you feeling you need an off day or you're too tired or you, um, you know, this kind of, you get into a habit of not making it through the week kind of thing. I said, this is how much money you're paying me or paying into the school every month or every year and not taking it. And it, sometimes it's like 2000 euros of their money. They're not using, mm. but uh, uh, you can, you can give a student a picture with this kind of transparency in that sense. Um, yeah. Um, I think maybe something else is to show that things like um, being vulnerable, being transparent about certain things. Um, obviously, I try to protect also a bit my private life uh, with my family. Um, but I think those things are important um, to create. Uh, uh, when we go back to the thing of hier hierarchy, um, that... Uh, yeah, I mean morals. What is moral? What is right? I, I guess you do what you you do what you intuitively feel is right uh, as a teacher, as a carer. I mean, I know that I know I have. Also, going back to Simon Sinek, this guy who wrote the book uh, "Leaders Eat Last," talks a lot about em empathy, and um, and keep keeping check on 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 what what goes on when when there is not enough empathy in in a space yeah not enough awareness for how people are how people are doing um i think we we, we as people we immediately think um if nobody's coming to us or 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 giving us feedback or then we start we start being a loner we start thinking maybe she's against me or maybe he doesn't care or like the, the cortisol is dripping. Mm. Yeah. And dripping cortisol is not good for us. The fight or flight is great for us. It, it, we, we have a burst and we can do something with it. But um, when the cortisol is just dripping, drip, drip, drip in our bodies all the time uh, because of uncertainty, not feeling safe in a space, not knowing what's really going on, what's not, not having clarity, not having transparency, not having, not feeling any empathy, then uh, your body is actually blocking the release of the, the other hormones that give us the feeling of belonging, that, that give the feeling of being able to embrace relationship and to uh, be willingly in this rela relationships, working relationships, learning relationships. Yeah, I, I must say that, you know, like, I think that it's a bit, it's such a, at least with the things I'm busy at the moment, I feel it's such an, uh, uh, an important topic, the question of, what does it mean to be a big uh, to, to be a positive leader and and how do you yield your power for the benefits of others and and yeah and, I, and, and again i want to say that personally you're a big inspiration for me with how to do it in, in, in a, in a in a positive way and 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 yes i i 
I mean, we've been talking already for quite a long, so I think it's maybe a good time to <laughs> say to thank you for, for coming yeah. here to my podcast and, and sharing everything that you've shared. And, and yeah, and I will do my best to, to share it with the world and to spread your positive message. <laughs> You're and, amazing. Uh, and yeah, and, uh, and I really hope that we will manage to, to see each other sooner than later. I do too. And, uh, <laughs> thank you very, very much for coming and sharing yeah. so much with me. I thank you, Matan. I really enjoyed chatting with you and I hope to see you soon. Yeah. Thank you very much, Debo. Yeah. For more movement related content and educational training programs, visit our website at www.movementlab.eu.